All right, good morning. Um, so I'm Matt Vaughn. Um, I'm uh, an HPC person at, at AWS, but I've got a background in genomics. Um, although my focus has been more on infrastructure and services over the years. So a lot of folks are using NextFlow on batch. And I think some of you are in a position um, where you're starting to scale up, or maybe you've already scaled up um, and you're, you're kind of happily motoring along. I'm gonna talk about three areas today where you might be able to optimize your workflows on batch. So why optimize? Well, think about your wasted resources, whether it's cloud or cluster or whatever, um, as compound interest. Um, you're out there, you're trying to cure COVID-3. <laughs> um, every one of your pipelines is wasting 5% of its runtime or it costs 8% more than it needs to. At the end of the year, you're not 5% slower. You're not 8% poorer. It has compounded like interest. Wastage compounds. So it's worth trying to avoid it where you can. So first of all, what's batch? Um, it's a fully managed, always on serverless scheduler. Um, it auto scales. Um, it uses containers to encapsulate um, software stacks. And it integrates with loads of other AWS services. And it's used by a large, diverse community running some really spectacular workloads. It also has, oh shoot, I'm so sorry. There we go. I cannot walk and shoot gun at the same time. <laughs> so it, um, it also has some really handy um, workflow integrations like NextFlow. So this is the architecture of NextFlow on batch. So essentially, um, pipelines are stored up in GitHub repos. Um, they get pulled into uh, an EC2 host where NextFlow is configured to use batch and the AWS CLI. Batch has compute environments, which are collections of EC2 instances running in an Elastic Container Service cluster um, with work sent to them by, um, uh, managed by job queues. Every EC2 instance has access to the AWS CLI and a container runtime, and it also has access to AWS S3 buckets. They can be configured to mount storage and also to have other software. So NextFlow creates jobs and submits them to Batch. Um, Batch tries to run them. If more capacity is needed, it provisions more EC2 instances um, in, the, in, the, in the cluster. Data gets staged in and out, but the image for every job gets pulled in from a registry, um, and then the job runs in the container. So there are some natural focal points in this architecture for leveling up your pipelines. The first is the image registry. So yesterday, Paolo pointed out that our image registries are a point of failure, and he's right. When batch launches an EC2 instance, before it can run your next flow job, it has to pull in the container. Um, but you get charged from the second that the instance hits running. So if there's a delay from between the time the instance starts running and that container gets pulled in, that's wasted time. That's wasted money. Um, so some pullover heads natural, but when it turns into an actual delay, that's a problem. So what causes these delays in your container pulls? So one, you're getting randomly throttled or you're hitting API limits. I'm looking at you, Docker Hub. Um, the service is having a bad day or it's under maintenance or it's just struggling to keep up or a backhoe is driven over its internet connection, something like that. Um, the third thing is the registry itself, the API is just a really chatty protocol. It runs over the web protocol, which isn't all that efficient in the first place. Even on a good day, there's a lot of back and forth. You can see it in the Docker CLI. Um, that's all latency. And our internet is really pretty slow, folks. So why externalize it all? Um, one suggestion is just to use in, a, in batch the Amazon Elastic Container Registry. So it's already integrated with Amazon ECS and EKS. It allows you using um, AWS um, identity privileges and, um, and primitives to collaborate and share securely. It's highly available and durable because it's built on, the, on S3 and other uh, Amazon services, and it has a public gallery like Docker Hub. So how do you use it? It's a little bit of a mystery to me when I first started using it. Um, but basically, it has a, it, you can use it in the AWS console, but you also can use it with the AWS CLI and standard container tooling. So here you can see you can get your login password, log in to um, use Docker login, create a repository, tag it, push it, pull it, 
et cetera. However, if you're just pulling from the public registry, um, you might really be in luck because as we announced the other day, all 9,000 biocontainers are being synced into the ECR public gallery. And there, it's as simple as Docker pull the um, public ECR AWS and then biocontainers, your repo and your tag. So this sounds great, but what's the performance look like? So to look at this, I, um, I compiled two data sets. One is I looked at pull speed. The other is I looked at essentially reliability for three, um, really four um, image registries. One was Docker Hub, two was Key, three was either private ECR or the public ECR. So for pull speed, um, I took 10 really popular um, bio containers, measured their pull speeds 10 times into EC2 instances in three zones um, around the world from all four registries. And I repeated this over multiple days. On the right is reliability. So this is data from Statuscator. This is a third party service that monitors hundreds of services. And I sum the disrupted minutes. Um, in other words, the time that those services were out of commission over three months. And I expressed everything in relative terms so I don't get in trouble with anyone. It also makes it easier to compare. Um, so. You can take away from this that Key is reliably faster than Docker Hub, probably because it's a little bit less popular. Um, private ECR is respectably fast. What's really fast, almost as fast as, as Key, is public ECR, probably because it's using CloudFront. Um, but where you really see um, a, a significant difference is in the reliability. So Docker Hub had almost 60 hours of downtime um, in various forms. Um, over the last three months. Key had about an hour and a half. Um, ECR had about five minutes. Not shown here at all was the variability in the pull speed, which was about 25% for Docker Hub. So sometimes it could go really fast, sometimes really slow. So recommendations on this front, really just the image registries aren't all the same. Um, they've got different feature sets, cost structures, performance characteristics. So. Keep an eye on those container startup um, latencies and just respond appropriately. So second is storage architecture. Um, so NextFlow on Batch can use S3, Elastic Block Store, Elastic File System, FSx for Lustre, or on instance NVMe storage. Um, as Angel showed you for parallel, for, uh, for, uh, for shared file systems yesterday, um, getting your storage architecture right can save you time and money. So I did some experiments uh, to illustrate this. So this is a synthetic benchmark that I like to use because it simulates what a lot of genomics workloads do. Um, it's about a terabyte of data um, on, a, on, a, on a directory, um, about a 60-40 mix of read and writes, small block sizes, four simultaneous threads, um, and I ran it on a beefy uh, EC2 instance. Um, and the file systems are Elastic Block Store default, so this is what you get by default at AWS, or Elastic Block Store Next Generation, which is GP3, Elastic File System, and FSx for Luster, both provisioned at 150 megabytes per second of throughput, and FSx for Luster provisioned at 1200 megabytes per second of throughput. Um, what you basically see is that EBS GP3 is faster out of the gate, and all you have to do is select GP3 when you provision your volume. The good news for everybody here is it's also 20% cheaper. So 20% faster, 20% cheaper. Um, EFS and FSX are both uh, great, file, uh, great shared file systems. EFS is gonna be a little bit more expensive due to its durability, um, but FSX scales really, really well um, when you provision more throughput. Now, I wanna compare these storage options to the performance of on-instant storage, which are really, really fast SSDs, uh, solid state disks. These are comically fast, and you can see why I had to add them to the graph separately. They're about eight times the performance of a, of a vanilla GP2 e, uh, volume. Um, so the cool thing is that these instance types are only about 18% more expensive than the corresponding C6 instances, so you get so you spend 18% more on the instance and you get eight times the, um, the local disk speed. So to compare these, um, for EBS, the default configuration 
You know, the easy thing about it is you don't have to do anything. Um, but really, for GP3, you get 3,000 IOPS out of the box, and it's 20% less expensive. The on-instance NVMe is really fast. One downside of EFS, FSX, and NVMe is you do have to do a little bit of configuration to the instance, but that's very well documented. So recommendations, definitely. If you're using EBS at all, switch to GP3 today. Um, if you need persistent shared storage and you're not using the new Fusion um, uh, approach um, that, was, uh, that was debuted yesterday for, uh, for NextFlow, use Amazon FSX for Lustre. And definitely don't sleep on um, EC2 instance level NVMe storage, especially if you've got IO heavy uh, workloads. Okay, third, instance types. So, um, this is obvious, this is what you think of at Amazon. Um, there's lots and lots of instances. So when you set up Batch, you define a compute environment. As part of that process, you tell Batch what kind of EC2 instances you want to use. If you don't tell it anything, Batch has a pretty nice strategy called the optimal strategy. That strategy optimizes for throughput. It picks what we call fourth generation instances. These are, there's lots and lots of them, and they are basically good enough to get the job done. But are there better options? Probably, because Amazon EC2 has over 500 instance types. Luckily, there's only a few that you really need to care about. So just to give you a flavor of how many types and kinds of, of instances there are out there, and this isn't even comprehensive, this is just kind of a taxonomy of Amazon EC2 instance types. You have general purpose instance types, compute optimized, memory optimized, accelerated, and storage optimized. The accelerated ones have FPGAs, um, GPUs, other weird pieces of silicon, et cetera. Just, just gives you an idea. And they're also um, from, they also have different um, on-instance features, uh, SSDs, different processor manufacturers, or architectures. But let me give you the secret decoder ring. This is how to look at the name of an instance and tell what's special about it. So on the left, is the instance family. What's it good for? It's compute optimized, that's why it's a C. If it's an M, that's memory optimized. The next position is the generation. Um, these go in linear order, they're numeric. The higher the generation, generally, the better the price performance. Um, so in other words, a seventh generation uh, instance is generally better than a fourth generation instance. The next position, um, these can be a variable number of letters. Sometimes there aren't any at all. These are attributes or special capabilities. Um, the most common ones that you'll see are A for it being an AMD processor, I for it being an Intel processor, G for it being a Graviton processor. That's Amazon's in-house 64-bit um, uh, ARM processor. N for network bandwidth optimized. D for having a special disk. Those are the ones that have the SSDs on them. Um, or Z for a uh, high frame rate. And then the last bit is the instance t-shirt size. Essentially, these represent a slice of a full server. That's what's so magical about the cloud. If you need a capability, you don't have to rent the whole server. You can just rent a slice. This gives you the flexibility to just use as much as you want to. So a lot of us are biologists here. Um, you've dealt with biologists, one thing that you know is that uh, I said that there was a single, a single character code that said what kind of, um, what, uh, what, uh, kind of instance there was. Here's an exception. There are also HPC instances. So this is an entirely new category of instance. These are tailored to HPC workloads. Um, these are usable in batch, but even if you don't use them in batch, I want you to be aware of them because they're really powerful. These are real like data center class HPC nodes. Um, they're powerful, they're fast, and surprisingly, they're often more cost effective than regular compute optimized nodes. So I don't wanna bore you with a bunch of performance graphs, but I wanna show you two slides worth to show you that the architecture of your node actually really matters. So first is a shootout between C5N, which is a fifth generation um, Intel uh, node, C6i, which is a sixth generation Intel node, and HPC 6a, which are these new um, high performance computing nodes from AMD. Um, on the left, single node performance for some molecular dynamics. On the right is multi-node. 
And as you can just generally see by looking at the green line, they are the, uh, the, uh, the HPC6 instances are generally faster and more performant and scale better. Um, the next slide covers Graviton specifically. So this is AWS's in-house arm. Anybody here who's running an M1 uh, Mac laptop, you know these things are cool, they're fast, they run forever, that's ARM. It's a pretty efficient um, uh, technology, it gets the job done. So these performance graphs come from our, our collaborators at ARM, caveat mTOR, because of course, you know, they're the processor, you know, uh, architecture team. But what I want to draw your attention to are the orange bars. So on the left, our runtime per alignment. These are very CPU intensive BWA class alignments. Um, the C7s are faster uh, significantly than C6Is or uh, C6As or C6Gs. Those are sixth generation AMD, Intel, and Gravitons. But they're also actually more price performance um, than the equivalent chips as well. So in the interest of full disclosure, um, you might want to use Graviton today. However, it's still an emerging architecture. Um, that means that not everything compiles on it. A lot of containers still aren't built for it. It's not well supported in Conda and Bioconda yet, but it may be worth that, uh, that effort. So my recommendations here are that you take apart your workflow process and benchmark every step of it. Um, the cloud makes it easy to do that. Nextflow makes it easy to do that with per process um, attributes and, and, and task definitions. Check it out on newer instances. Check it out on, newer, on different uh, storage architectures. Tailor your batch compute environment. Um, make different compute environments. Make different job queues to support your specific Nextflow processes. And most importantly, as you're doing this, keep an eye on new instance launches at the AWS blog. So my take home here, um, I've shown you today that there are really about three major areas where you can improve NextFlow on batch. So imagine shaving 10% off your launch time, 10% faster disk speed, and 10% faster processors on every single NextFlow job that you run. That's gonna add up. Um, and it's relatively tractable with just a little bit of tweaking. So I encourage you to do it. Most of you are scientists or no scientists, so get in there measure things. Um, you've got time, um, you've got you know, the resources, your time is valuable, um, your opportunities are valuable, and people are building things in the cloud for you. So get in there and try to take advantage of them. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Matt, for the talk. We have a question from Conrad. So, is it possible to tell which EC2 instance types are guaranteed to be available in a given region to minimize wait time? We've had issues with Batch Forge sitting around for hours waiting for GPU instances, which are rare or even missing in our region. So, there's no way to tell. Um, so, the question is is there a way of telling what instance types are guaranteed to be available? There isn't a way of guaranteeing. Um, that instance capability is going to be available. You can take advantage of um, instance reservations, and um, so those could be dynamic instance reservations, or um, you can also, um, you or your, uh, your institution can also buy reserved instances if it's really time critical. Okay. Uh, and we have a question from Matteo. What practices would you suggest for identifying and debugging bottlenecks in the areas that you highlighted? So, honestly, you know, you're, you're, so the process really looks like, you know, you have a hypothesis that there isn't a bottleneck. Um, you see that there's a bottleneck. Um, you just get in and really measure a, just measure a few things. Um, you know, if you think that it's a disk issue, um, you know, look at, you know, there are, uh, there are disk benchmarking tools that you can run alongside your code. One of the nice things about what you're doing in batch is that you can launch the same instance. You can pull in the same container. You can set up the same environment in, in, a, in an isolated EC2 node. And 
hand run the code that you would still be running in, um, in, in NextFlow on that instance. And so you can actually get in there and you don't have to worry about the additional abstraction of batch. That's certainly what I do um, for almost anything. It's just kind of make, you know, construct a little test environment. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite everyone now for the coffee break and feel Thanks. free to, if you have more questions, to look for Matt. Thank you.